Hey, thanks for watching this fun and swervy interview with artist Rachel Mulder. She hails from Wisconsin and now is based in Portland, Oregon. Rachel is a process-driven artist who uses a variety of different mediums to explore and create art. I met Rachel about three handfuls of years ago when we were working at the same place and she was making art with typewriters. At the time, though, I didn't know very much about Rachel or her art because we worked in different departments and we really didn't see each other at work. I knew she was awesome because that's clear from just meeting her. And also because even though we didn't work side by side, she joined the creative team on a couple of short film competitions I entered, once playing a role in front of the camera and once behind it, both very important. Her awesomeness was slash is undeniable. So I was super glad when Rachel agreed to do this interview with me and talk about and explore creativity, art, and life. What is it like to be a working artist? We have a blast answering that question, and we also go a little deep. Stay tuned afterwards, and I'll rejoin you to review some of my favorite parts. Until then, though, let's join the interview. Rachel, I would like to thank you so much for doing this interview today, and um, yes, talking to us about what it's like to be an artist and how you became an artist and how you continue to be an artist. And, you know, it's always curious to hear how people get from like the start, their birth to where they are now. I had like caring humans in my family, but, and also I swear I'm going to get to your answer, but I like to go around in a huge messy circle to get there. Um, <laughs> But like, I didn't know how to make eye contact with, like, I didn't, I had to learn that you were supposed to make eye contact with people when I was like nine years old. So like, but I, but I do remember like when I was a kid, I just spent a lot of time alone. I was like the little baby. My brother was nine years older than me. So it was like, and then my grandparents were like my built-in babysitters. And then my parents both worked in factories. So I would just like make these like worlds myself. I would just like hang out with the boulder in my backyard that had a little puddle in it that collected water that I loved. Like, and there was this clump of trees and then I would like put my plastic animals in the flower beds, like on the patio. It's not like no one interacted with me, but that's like what I remember the most. Oh, that sounds fun, actually. <laughs> I'm still like my favorite person to hang out with. I think that is great when we can appreciate hanging out with ourselves. <laughs> so did you did you do art, um, a lot of art as a child, or was it more about just that imaginative playtime? No, it was always, I mean, I, I've, I've always been a drawer. Like, I remember this one, I think I was like in third grade, and I had this beautiful stuffed lamb, and it was like, so gorgeous it was like kind of realistic but had like very cutesy eyelashes and I remembered being like okay I'm gonna sit down to draw this and I remember being like ah. my frustration came from like I can see this thing in front of me how come I can't recreate that exact image on paper from that time until this time I've zigzagged between so many different ways of making in order to like achieve like one of one of the many mediums I like to work with is making like portrait commissions of people's like pets and beloved humans but let's be real everyone wants drawings of their pets more than people and so like I have figured out how to draw the lamb do you remember when you knew or realized that you wanted to be an artist? This would have been in my like young adulthood. Like I chose to go to art school. Somehow my Midwest factory working family said, yeah, okay, go to art school. I mean, I think it was a little bit lucky because that was in 2003. So it would have been when 
all the millennials were urged to like, it's like, you have to go to some kind of college to do anything. So it was like, I had done a lino cut in high school, but I chose printmaking because of all the like weird ducts and like archaic machinery in the <laughs> room. So I was just like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And it's so wild because that those techniques, I mean, part, it's kind of like a chicken egg situation, but those techniques just like lent themselves so well to my brain and are so like deeply embedded in how I practice now, even though I'm a drawer more than a printmaker, but everything I do still like feels like it wants to be printmaking. Well, and really what, sorry, some of the things that made printmaking like underscore like, or like why it worked for my brain was that it was like, you were constantly doing like 12 things at once. Like it was like, okay, I'm going to coat these plates over here. I'm going to be melting rosin onto these plates here while I have some other plates in the acid bath. And I'm also cutting paper and I've also got to remember to soak the paper. I am like, like, I don't have a lot of like, we're going to get astrological. I don't have a lot of like Capricorn in my chart, but I, there's something I don't remember or care what it was. I'm like super ruled by Saturn and it's so very clear in everything that I do. For example, the typewriter drawings that I did when around the time when we met, like I had this image following me around that I was like, I want to make this into something. And I had always wanted to draw with a typewriter because I was like oh that would be a fun like grid type way to like create something and then without really thinking about it I started cutting down paper that I had into five inch squares without really planning it in advance but I gridded it all out and then I started working looking at a picture of a grid and then hang on I have a visual aid this is the drawing. It's a stack of squares. I think it's 250 or something. It's all typewritten. And when you lay it all out, it makes this like figurative drawing. And I start when I started it, I started at the bottom. I like built it like it was a building. Like I started at the bottom and went up all the way. Did you know the big picture before you started on the little squares? I did kind of know the big picture. I had this like old and great for that one. I did, but my process varies. So we'll get to the other stuff. But for that one, I did have, I just had this like old, like, um, what is it? Oh, public domain, like etching or engraving of this woman who's like enswathed in these like folded fabrics and going like this. And then, so I gridded that image out. So I was just working from like looking at an image. And then I ended up changing, once I got up to like five feet, I was like, wait, I got to do something. So then I shrunk the top. So it's like, she's inside of a giant, a more, a larger version of herself. So it was kind of a magical, happy accident where it was like, I was just, turning myself into a weird copier machine, but with like a bizarre tool, a typewriter. And then conceptually it changed midway. So I think that is an important part of my process where I'm not afraid to like swerve into another direction. It's just totally different depending on what I'm doing. Like, yeah, the typewriter that was like a rigid, like, here we go, we're doing this. And then Interestingly, speaking of the meat suits that we were talking about off camera, I like can't, I had to quit crocheting and typewriter drawing because I gave myself severe nerve damage. Again, kind of the gift of being able to swerve is also the gift that is allowing me to continue making art in spite of like losing my ability to work in a way that served me at one point. My professor, Valdek Dinnerman from my ad, he was like, Oh my God, there's a beautiful, huge butterfly outside my window. Um, <laughs> he said, nothing is precious. It's so tricky because nothing is precious and everything is precious. Like it's both, both just are true in general, but, and like, if you're 
like when if ever I'm making something and I'm getting really too fussy over the details, that's when it goes wrong. It's like I have to be like aligned with myself. And like it is like a pl- it it comes from like a a weird spiritual place. Like I have to like get in and I like sit at my desk and I just like try to think of like I have like especially going back to like the illustration figurative like here I can these aren't my favorite but I'll just show you this one for an example like when I make stuff that's like this Mm -hmm. um, I think of you know it's like I'm sitting down and I'm just thinking of like okay what is it I'm like what's the feeling I'm trying to convey or what's the like Maybe I even just have an idea of like, oh, I want an arm that like looks like this or something. And then I usually just start like it starts with an ear or an arm or a toe. Like I don't a lot of times I do start with the feet first. I like to work from the ground up, I guess. Um, Yeah, it's just like it's like it starts with the brain, but then it you just kind of like allow it to grow. Like it's like, oh, this would this feels right if like I'm adding a line here or not. And actually that kind of goes into the shower friends too, how those are, are born. I was fascinated to when you first started posting those on Facebook, like here's, you know, my shower friend and, and one, I'm also fascinated with how different they seem to be able to look. I mean, it's crazy that these, you're really making these individual distinct characters. And they started because I had short hair for a long time, like I do again now, but I had long hair. When it started growing long enough, I had to come up with a solution to prevent it from clogging the drain, but then became like a ritual that I like can't not do. Like it would be a waste of the hair stuck to my hand if I didn't at least try. And they start kind of in the same way that I was describing with the gel pens. First, I'm just taking it off the wall trying not to have soap in my eyes and sticking it on there. And then, um, you know, I'm like, oh, this looks kind of like an ear or that looks like a nose. And then it's like, here comes an eyebrow. And it's just like slow. They just like kind of intuitively come into being. What does art do for you? Like, what is the role that art plays in your life? Yeah. Woo. Well, this is interesting, especially like the on um, that we're having this conversation like on this day. Um, so I'm in in therapy right now. I'm working on a lot of understanding that in my childhood, I like I experienced a lot of like extreme feelings and then was punished for them. So I like learned how to not have that. Like when I was a kid at school, I just like wanted to disappear. Like I wished I could just be a fly on the wall and like not exist, which I didn't really realize until this year that that's really sad. (laughs) Um, And all of that to say, like drawing has always helped me like the narrative have always illustrated like where I'm at actually okay the poodle people this is a good example these these people are like raging out now and like have a practical per like they save they or they fundraise money for abortion um funds and reproductive rights organizations but when I first started drawing them when I was 23 they were these like weird poodle people that it was like my alter ego these like loungy poodle people so I think sometimes my art is like a little compass and I'm really lucky that I get to be playful that I mean because art is like a safe place to do that and like be your like full extreme self and like it's interesting I'm like learning how to do that now would you say that then um it sounds to me like what you're saying is so is does art play or have a therapeutic role for you yes I can't not make art every day like I have I have to 
Um, yeah, I think it's important to say that, and especially because it's true, but I just, you know, I think it's such a common uh, belief that making art is somehow silly or not real or important. But if you're somebody who really feels like you need to make art every day and that is really connected to your sense of purpose and identity and well-being, then um, then it seems like, you know, then that is what it is and it is important and art can have an impact on the people around us, the world around us um, on a large scale and a small scale. So I think art is important. Totally. Well, and thank you for saying that because that is one of the big, like, um, so, I mean, it's apparent even in how I was explaining the poodle people to you. I was like, look, it serves a practical purpose. It's a fundraiser. Like, so I'm still combating and unlearning that ethos of like, oh, art is frivolous. What I, what I do doesn't, mean anything like there's still these little like evil demons that are like in there trying to tell me that it's not but like and I'm glad you said the word silly too I'm gonna um softly paraphrase my favorite astrologer Jessica Lanyato. I just remembered there was one episode of her podcast where she was talking about how like, well, why do we, like, a lot of people don't want to believe in astrology or magic or w spirituality because it's silly, but, like, why, why is silly bad? And then when she, like, looked at it even deeper, it's like, well, what are those, th so who, who are the people doing the silly things? It's women and queers doing silly things, right? So, like, attacking and oppressing people who are tapping into their like authenticity I mean because they're a threat but calling it silly makes them fight makes us fight ourselves with our own shame um it's time to be unafraid I'm curious um in your sort of life and pursuing your um, life as an artist and making that life, have you ever had to make a decision that you knew that someone you loved and or respected um, wouldn't approve of, but you made that decision anyway? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really tricky. I mean, it, it definitely, definitely my dad is the person that I would have to like I have I mean first conversely there's so many people in my life like I've worked in restaurants for years and that was like so lovely because it gave me like a flexible schedule that allowed me time to make art until it didn't until I had to stop until I got to stop this spring to be a full-time artist um but you know, I've had so many, so many people, just people that I barely knew or people regular is like, I've had so much support. So on that other side, um, I had this like really awful conversation with my dad and his partner um, where they were like, why don't you just get a real job? And I was like, but I like, I'm paying my bills. I've got I've got it under control. Like, what are you like? And he would send me like job listings for like a train conductor. I was like, have you met me? Do you think I could operate a train? Like, I feel like anyone watching this video would be like, I am not riding that person's train. That's instant death. I'm like happy with my life. I like where my life is. And um, I mean, I think it's, it, I think it's just sad because it's that thing of like when you are able to like enjoy your life it's holding up a mirror 
to people who can't conceive of that. And I'm like, I'm, I grieve for my dad. I mean, we are like, we are estranged now and it's like very, it's like a month, a month. I'm only a month in of having zero parents now because my mom died in 2010 the only thing I have to do is like prioritize and protect myself and like know that it's going to be like a forever healing mission and like yeah would you would you call that um like self-love or would you call it just self-confidence or I mean it's definitely self-love I have a note on my little on deck thing that says have a love affair with art (laughs) and like um this is also I mean I think it's all tied into I'm such a romantic oh my god and I realized I've been like a serial monogamist for 20 years and um I mean many 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 relationships but this is the first time like truly the first time in my life where I'm actually like actively trying not to date because it's very easy to forget to take care of yourself when you're busy taking care of somebody else all of that to say like yes like feeding the things that like give me bring meaning to my life so like working on art is feeding myself is loving on myself and like you know caring for my friends allowing my friends to care for me it's wild that it's all I mean it's not wild it makes sense that it's all interconnected now in terms of um creating the art and especially now that you're basically um living as an artist you're paying for your you know life through your art are there things that you do to help keep yourself on track or feeling good about what you're doing or you know just in general to maintain your artistic sort of journey and lifestyle well this is I gotta show you (laughs) this is um this is my executive function behind me on this chalkboard sometimes I get so excited to work on art I'll like wake up in the morning and then suddenly it's three in the afternoon I haven't eaten anything I haven't gone to the bathroom like it's just like a nightmare so now that I'm now that I'm a late 30s person (laughs) um yeah I have to like have a serious structure I or I go off the rails can you tell by talking to me but it, it's tricky because I need flexibility in my routine because the potential for swerving to answer your actual question though okay I um I now that I don't work in the restaurant I go to bed at like 10 or 11 p.m and then I just wake up at 6 30 in the morning my eyes just open at 6 30 on the dot sometimes 6 <laughs> 15. And I'm just like, okay, here I go. I have my coffee. My ideal art making possibility is waking up, sitting at my desk and doing creative work, like inviting drawing in or like doing something. Um, Because if I, if I start to work in like computer land, like updating my website or doing social media, I get so sucked in because it's very easy to get like, well, here are all these, like your capitalistic survival scarcity brain kicks in and you're like, well, I got to finish all these spreadsheets and do all this stuff. And oh, if I, I hope I make some sales today. Um, if you start with that, then you're like kind of, that's like kind of painting the entire day. So there was this one day where I woke up and it felt like I was a marionette. Like I just got carried over. Like pl- it was like, I woke up. I didn't even have coffee. It was just like, I plopped down at my desk and started drawing. So um, that is my, that's my, <laughs> that's ideally how I would start. And I think I read a, something on one of your Instagram posts or maybe it was Facebook, something about you have a clothesline. On- <laughs> yeah. This is my clothesline. 
Oh, and I'm really excited about this because, well, and it's, it's multi-use. <laughs> this is like my latest commission, portrait commission, in progress portrait commission I'm working on. <laughs> Hi, Tomasina. Can you hear her yelling? Yeah. <laughs> and then not all of it's essential. Some of it's just <laughs> trying. <laughs> Do you need attention? <laughs> these were drying up here and now they're just here because I like how they look and then this is pretty fun because it's a it's so meta it's a drawing of a thing hanging on a laundry line but now it's actually hanging on a line we but this is my oh. drawings that the the band the dumpies I've done all their album covers and then I got to do or they licensed this image from me and then I got this cool shirt it's very smart this clothesline idea you have you have it really it just feels nice you know I hear you have a turn the tables question for me I sure do oh my god Angela what made you fall in love with the video as your chosen medium <laughs> I'm so glad you asked this question because it was really fun to think about um the answer the very first thing that came to mind is how much I loved comic books when I was, you know, young. And then I remember this book um, about the movie Grease with John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. And it really wasn't a, a book about the movie, but it was a book of the movie. It was called a photo novel. I looked it up on Google. Photo with an F, not a PH. It was essentially like a comic book. The story was told, though, with pictures from the movie. You know, it was just enough of a connection. And then if you like fast forward, you know, 20 years or so to when I was in graduate school at Vir Virginia Commonwealth University, I was uh, getting my master's in art history and one semester, I wound up taking two undergraduate classes, one of which was a 16 millimeter filmmaking class. <clears throat> this was like before people had computers at home where they were editing movies. And if cell phones existed, I'm pretty sure everybody didn't have one. And if they did, you couldn't make a movie on it. And so I... Um, took this class. I made like a three to four minute black and white silent film. And I was sitting there in a dark room looking through a viewfinder at the strips of film that I would be rolling through the viewfinder. And then wow. all the edits were made with a cement splicer. So you actually cut the film and you had to submit it to the next piece of film. I remember sitting there at that little workstation and time was just so different. It felt yeah. like 15 minutes to me, but it would be, you know, hours and hours. And I just knew that I loved that process. I fell in love with it and um, specifically editing at first. And I just really still love it. I love that it incorporates sound and music and text, whether it's seen on the screen or spoken word. And I love how it is actually the documenting the passage of time by merely playing it. A second of video equals a second in real time. And I love that you can explore and play with that as much as you can document it. And, um, and then on top of all that formal stuff that was just interesting, um, like we've touched on today, you know, life is not always easy, even as a younger person. And, you know, I was 11 um, when my father died and I saw him die. He died in front of me, had a heart attack. And, Movies were just really a safe space to be and to think about things and to question things and to feel things. And it offered an escape from that reality. And um, there's just a lot of emotional support that I got from movies as well. And so 
it's just a real um, kismet or, you know, a spark. That's so cool. And it's so special how your heart can't help but find the stuff that it would love. And I love that you're also a process, process person. And then can you tell me more about the person you have connected um, with this project for a future interview? Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. So my friend, Christina, she is also DJ Stina. Um, And also, I barely even know how to describe her job, but everything she does is magic. And I think that is like her art. Her art is she like, She's an entomologist and also like an educator of teachers. And like, I think, because again, I can't give you the like, the simple answer, um, but my, my uh, charcuterie board of an answer is she showed up to my birthday and this was in um, more innocent times, 2018 or 19, 2018. And she showed up to my birthday happy hour. We were just talking, suddenly starts creating a balloon animal out of her small bag, suddenly has like a pump and is just like exploding with balloon animals. And then we went out to karaoke after and suddenly from her bag, again, it's like a magic, it's like Mary Poppins, right? Like suddenly out of this bag, there's just like, tambourines and other instrument it was just like no matter what she does she is like the magician i mean and she makes art too she's a printmaker she's makes zines she does mail art she does all kinds of she does she does it all well cool i'm looking forward to talking with her so thank you so much for connecting us Oh my gosh. Thank you, Anna. Oh, and thank you, Rachel. Thank you for doing this interview. Thank you. What a blast. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And thanks for sticking around as I review some of my favorite parts from the interview. I would love to know what your favorite parts are, too. Do they overlap with mine? Or maybe you have different favorite parts? Comment below. And if you comment, then maybe other viewers will, will follow suit. Anyway, so like Rachel said, that interview was a blast. It was fun to learn more about Rachel and her art. Through the interview, I learned that Rachel and I have some things in common, like we were both the first to go to college among our core nuclear family, and we both used to want to be invisible, though for me, I think that may have lasted until my 30s. And it seemed that we also both like to call out when something is meta, like her Dumpy's t-shirt with an image, her image, of something hanging on a clothesline that was actually hanging on a clothesline. I just love that. And speaking of the clothesline, did you notice how excited Rachel was when I asked her about it? It was great how eager she was to talk it through. I love how fun and practical it is, too. Just like that amazing executive functioning chalkboard. Come to think of it, I might need one of those. Another favorite moment of mine is when she said, it's time to be unafraid. When I rewatched that part of the interview for the first time, it was like a big gong went off in my head. What powerful words. They really resonate with me and now I'm going to try to practice unafraidness daily. I'm sure some days I'll be better at it than others. What about you? Is it time to be unafraid? I have so many favorite parts from this interview. I can't share them all. But another one was when she talked about the happy accident of her exoskeleton typewriter drawing. And when she remembered the morning that she woke up and just plopped at her desk like a marionette and started creating art without even having her coffee first. If you want to see more of Rachel's art and learn more about her online shop and Patreon page, then check out her website, 
which I'm also including in the text below this video. And if you'd like to support my production of these videos about creative people and creativity and living a creative life, and also unlock access to bonuses like unreleased footage, behind the scene details, or commissioning your own video interview, then check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Angela Edwards. I'm also including that in the text below. And please let me know you're watching and liking the videos by liking and commenting below and by subscribing to the channel. If the channel gets 100 subscribers, then YouTube will let me customize the URL. It would be great to make the Improv Your Life channel official with its own URL. And I appreciate your help by subscribing below. Most of all, though, thank you for watching. I hope you're enjoying these videos. And be sure to check back because the next one's already in the works. Thank you.